Explicity Cast from Explicity. The assault party had positioned itself on these two floors, both with long corridors, one side of which opened out to a lawn. Here the commissioner stood. He proceeded as a conductor might with a symphony orchestra. There were two men, one on each floor with door busters, dense metal cylinders with handles on top that were swung to shatter the locks from their bolts. At the commissioner's signal, he looked at his watch, raised his hands slowly and then brought them down together. The battering rams began to crack the doors open. 101 on the first floor and 201 on the second went first, then 102 and 202 and so on. Each took about 10 seconds, a big swing back and then forward, and then a few seconds to the next door. On the third floor the action was simple. A few men silently went to the doors and bolted them from outside. By the end of the first minute, 106 and 206 had fallen. Into each of these, the commissioner sent four men, two with plastic zip ties, which they locked onto the wrists of the sleeping, confused, terrified, or delighted, these being the lovers who were up for being cuffed, targets. There was no resistance from this otherwise powerful set of legislators. The occupant of 107, a single fellow whose partner had not returned from the previous night, Heard the commotion and staggered to the door to inquire why his sleep was being disturbed. He opened it at the same time as the battering ram, having been swung back, was on its way forward. There was no scope for the metal beast to be meaningfully slowed. The legislator barely alert froze as the cylinder took him between the legs, thudding into the soft flesh of his privates. The point of contact in this pendulum-type motion was just an inch or so from the extreme position. But to the man, even that light blow to the nether regions was too much in the fog of this battle. The helmeted and visored combatants, the noise and the chaos, the sight of his colleagues being manhandled, this dastardly blow—all of that was too much for him. He began to wail loudly. Most of us do not color code our threat levels, but nations do. Following 9/11, the Homeland Security Advisory System in America in 2002 came up with the warning system that we all know and love today in our TV shows: green, blue, yellow, orange, and red, depending obviously on the severity of the threat. Government officials meticulously plan and practice their responses to each threat level. War games for the mandarins, if you like. But what if the threat was not a threat in the conventional sense of some action against us that the nation must defend, but rather a threat that comes from nothing at all? One example is, say, the leader of the nation passes without warning, and the administration suddenly loses its alpha and is left rudderless. No natural successor, no one in charge, and the panjandrums receive no instructions on what to do next. Building an entire novel based upon this intriguing possibility as a foundational premise is my guest today, journalist, author, analyst, and commentator, and now novelist, Akar Patel, known for his extensive body of work in politics, culture, and political economics, has ventured into the world of fiction with this debut novel, After Messiah. A novel is a remarkable canvas for expressing ideas. freeing the author from the constraints of traditional media like newspapers newspapers for instance are required to simply and clearly report what happened but sometimes as a news person you get to know about things that you cannot report by the usual rules of reportage such as off the record information that might be of great importance the edit page of the newspapers for such things where you might reveal or hint at something but present it as having editorialized it after messiah raises essential questions about the role of the bureaucracy and the responsibility it bears his superior skills in prose ensure that his novel is not just thought provoking but also an effortless and often very funny read akar is not one to stay snugly inside the box He busts out the whole, eager to learn and illuminate ethic, and thus escapes the confines of all convention. Today, 
After decades of profound commentary, he unveils this novel. While After Messiah might be his debut novel, this is not his debut appearance on The Literary City. He is my first returning guest after almost two years of the show. He joins me from his home in Bangalore, a city we share. And now, it gives me great pleasure to say, Akar Patel, welcome back to The Literary City. Thank you for having me back, Ramji. Of the many things that you've done, the one that intrigues me the most is when you took charge of Amnesty International in India. What led to that? I had been retired, um, in a manner of speaking, for four or five years before that. I was running a business out of Bombay. Right. And at some point, having made a little bit of money, I felt that uh, we ought to move to Bangalore, which is something that my wife, Atushita, also wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I spent those four or five years reading. I read through... Uh, the Greeks, beginning with Herodotus, mm -hmm. um, Plato, the playwrights, and so on, and the histories, and then the Romans. And then uh, at some point, I felt that just reading was insufficient to pass the day by. Uh, fortuitously, at, at this same point in time, this is mid-2015, a friend of mine who's a lawyer who represents a pro bono all the 370-odd people who are on death row in India. Um, he was he was with us and he was asking me whether I'd be up for doing this job, which, which not too many people wanted. A, because it didn't pay much. B, because it was a manager, corporate type job um, on the top of an organization which the government was hostile to. And... I was I was intrigued by the work and I had known a little bit about Amnesty, but I took the job up without knowing too much about the human rights space. And what it is that I learned on the job kept me uh, interested enough to stay on with it and I have stayed with it since. And what did you learn on the job? Well, many things. Some of the most banal things are that the sector tends to attract a very high quality type of person and I'm not being modest when I say that I was the least qualified person in that office. It was full of lawyers, scholars, many of whom had PhDs, journalists who were able to gather the evidence on, on the ground, fundraisers who knew how it was that you could approach your strangers and ask them for money successfully. Uh, the sort of skill that you don't find ordinarily in most white-collar offices. Uh, and, this, and these were people doing this work, as I said, for not that much money. So I was both surprised and uh, educated. And that brings us to the matter of responsibilities in a democracy. Normally, I in these conversations, I talk an author through their body of work. In this case, for one, we already did that. For our listeners, there's a link in the podcast description to my earlier conversation with Akar. And for another, your novel After Messiah reads like a compendium of your body of work. It's like a memoir of your mind. Would that be a reasonable thing to say? Uh, <laughs> when one begins to write fiction, one quickly learns that in the absence of material, there's not that much uh, meaningful that one can put down on paper or, or on the screen. It tends to be about what interests you at that point in time. And I think that with writers, uh, especially writers of fiction, when you're faced with the blank page or the empty screen, one has to fall back on what one knows. Uh, Nippon said famously that there are no prodigies in writing, but you do have prodigies in painting, in music, in mathematics, in chess. The reason why we don't have prodigies in writing is that one requires experience to be able to distill it and be able to put it down and set it down as a literature, whatever form that might take. And for me, I think the learning experiences and the interesting aspects of what I've lived through over the last decade have come from my work and what I've learned from it. I'd like now to delve directly into your book, After Messiah. We've seen in history that there's sometimes a point when mere psychophancy goes beyond identifiable things like material gain and goes to something a little deeper, a little more existential, like a tribal or unquestioning filial devotion and blind obedience, which creates tribal leaders or messiahs. What, according to you, is the conventional wisdom as to why this happens? I think primitive societies 
want messianic figures, mm-hmm. which is one reason why messianism happened in the West and the Western part of what is the East fairly early on in humankind. I think it's the second phase, if you might put it that way, after having received the written word, man turned to how it is that he could engage with God. Right. And having a prophet, somebody who knew more, somebody who understood a confused uh, and confusing world more than you did, Mm -hmm. was a comfortable figure. You could rely on somebody and you would not need to engage with the world yourself. True. Because the problems of the world that were not resolvable for you would be solved by this one great figure. And I think it's a sort of attractive idea. It tends to fall away in literate societies, so you don't tend to have that as much in the latter part. And I think once in that same period of about a thousand years, beginning with Buddha and sort of ending with, or maybe beginning with maybe a Zoroaster, if you go a little bit, uh, beyond him and ending with what the Muslims call the last prophet. After that, very few figures emerge who are able to move the the globe in a way with a message that they feel is uh, compelling. Uh, we have had, after um, Nietzsche in Germany, the idea that maybe it's not so much just wisdom, but also raw power that somebody brings. And we saw what happened with that idea in the Germany of the 30s. Sure. Um, But I would say that it's a fairly primitive uh, way in which man looks at nature, in which man looks at what appears to be difficult to resolve and then finds comfort in a figure who both says he is and is believed to be a kind of a messiah. Oh, yes. We are seeing the resurgence of uh, political messiahs of of late. And in your book, this figure is referred to as the big man. These words on page 89. The state did not appear to exist outside the big man's person. It was he who had been chosen, he who was popular. And the state was meant to serve him as he delivered himself to the people. Now, given all the efforts of the world to create institutions that were designed to protect democracies and and keep things from becoming uh, dictatorships or autocracies, it begs the question, do the people in a democracy not have the responsibility to actively resist autocracy? They do. I think it needs to come from within. And one of the problems is that because of their experience of a century ago, the idea of nationalism took on a negative sentiment in large parts of the world, uh, particularly in Europe. By this, you mean the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party? And the party. First World War as well, that they discovered that right, expansionism right. in terms of geography normally led to pain. And then they, you had to figure out how to live with your neighbors in a way that was beneficial, yes, but also in a way that required compromise. Um, and that necessarily also meant that you couldn't see your nation as being superior to uh, the nation of your neighbor. Uh, In India, we haven't been through that phase yet. Uh, And also, it's more difficult to communicate the negative sentiment in the words that we use for nationalism. Rashtravad is a word that is infused with uh, positive qualities. It cannot be negative. We use it in our parties all the time. Um, And therefore, uh, the idea is appealing because the antidote to it hasn't yet been injected into the nation because we haven't suffered the kind of experiences that uh, Western Europe had uh, is a century ago or two wars. So you've got this, the you've got a positive, warm sentiment towards nationalism and then you've got this figure who's able to capture it in a way that others before him chose not to. I think it's important to uh, examine that as well, that charisma is useful only when it is deployed. Gandhi chose to deploy his uh, ascetic charisma. He chose to let the world uh, see him in a particular way through what he wore or what he ate or what he did not eat rather than purely uh, through what he um, wrote or said or did. Um, totally. And I think that Uh, We are living through a period in our country's history where, once again, a charisma, a sort of more macho charisma is being deployed. Uh, 
that speaks both to uh, fortifying the weaknesses of the past as well as speaking uh, to the nationalism that is uh, embedded um, in this culture. I think both of them come together um, and have uh, produced a figure such as the one that we are seeing before us. And these words on the same page. The difference between dissent and treason had been erased because dissent against the ruler was treason. For a large part of the voting bloc, are these things not just philological niceties? I would, I would agree uh, that, that, that that is the case here, that um, the idea, um, not only from the point of view of what you said, which I, which I uh, only accept, but also from, from the point of view of uh, the notion that democracy begins and ends with the ballot box, that once you receive popular endorsement, it is yours to do what you want to do with it for five years. And any opposition to what it is that you do is not just opposition to your policies or perhaps your person, but to democracy itself. And therefore, it becomes easier in such a place to see dissent, whether it comes out of the opposition parties or it comes out of the media or it comes out of civil society as being a borderline treason. What an interesting thought. What happens between elections does not have to be democracy and everything belongs to the ruler. Yeah, it's 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 not the way that most of us would see it. Uh, there's a think tank in Washington, a fairly conservative one, or Freedom House, which grades, which has created for many decades nations uh, and how democratic or not they are. And 40% of the weightage that they assign to a nation comes out of the uh, electoral process proper. Can you form a political party? Do people have the right to vote? Can they vote without fear? Is there an independent election commission and so on? All of that is 40% of the weightage that there is. The 60% bit, and and India does really well there, that you do have the right to form a party, you do have the right to vote, you do have an independent election commission. They don't go into the, the idea of funding and bonds and so on, but, the, but that's fine, we can leave it there. The 60% where India fails and has failed for the last 3-4 years on their scorecard has been on the issue of individual rights. Do you have the freedom of association that your constitution promises or do you have the right to free speech? Do you have, yeah, those are the places where we, we falter. And we fall up because of the the idea that a democracy is limited to going and voting. And once you've voted, then you shut up and you accept whatever it is that comes down to you. So voting in an election can be the moral equivalent of a palace coup or an armed inter- insurrection or one king invading the other's territory. That's well put. I think that capture of the state is what voting... Uh, gives you, and once you capture the state, it is it's yours to do what you want to do with it. Your novel captures that very well. So, what is its antithesis? A responsibility to hold government to account, and do we have the maturity? You know, this reminds me of uh, of Benjamin Barber, who wrote that amazing book, Jihad versus MacWorld. In another book, and I can't remember the title now, he called uh, what you describe pretty much as an infantilization of adults. Do we in India need to be infantilized or are we already there? <laughs> it's, it's a debate that goes back to uh, the uh, Iliad. I think the, the antithesis is always uh, anarchy. Interesting. That there were fairly conservative columnists in The Spectator who, while dealing with the rise of China in the 90s, cautioned the other writers around them to say that while freedom was important, order was also important. And while a large part of the world where you had a billion China men and Chinese women marching in lockstep was to them a good thing. I think that uh, Socrates would, would have agreed uh, in many ways that he, he becomes more uh, conservative or at least through the eyes of Plato, he becomes more conservative the older he gets. Yes. The uh, Iliad begins with this figure of this sort of man who's shown as deformed, he's shown as a humpback, mm-hmm. a soldier who asks Agamemnon why it is that all these thousands of men have been shipped across to fight over one person, one one a woman, a man called Thersites. And he's whipped, he's beaten up because to question authority, 
is to encourage uh, uh, chaos, to encourage uh, anarchy. And anarchy is something that most of the conservative Greeks thought was an evil. So we will always have this tension between having a state that, while it's democratic, is authoritarian in many ways, and a state that, while it's democratic, is seen as tending towards anarchy because you've given too many rights to the individual, and this sort of individual is using those rights in a way that the state doesn't like. This goes to our inability to conflate civil rights with civic responsibilities. Yeah, we've always we've, we've always had this problem. So the United States, the first uh, amendment of the Constitution says that Congress shall have no right to curb free speech and you know uh, freedom of faith and so on. A uh, congregation in India, the 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 first amendment says exactly the opposite as what the um, uh, first amendment of the U.S. Constitution says. So Nehru brings this rule in because he feels that this the the levels of freedom that have been given through the Constitution are are too high, and you need to bring in some some element of uh, stick. To be able to curb the population. And this brings me to the panjandrums in the palace, the bureaucrats. Most people, and I know this from my experience of my years in Delhi, do not understand the responsibilities of a permanent bureaucracy, such as the one that we have. Bureaucrats, whether they're government servants or soldiers, have a responsibility to resist illegitimate orders or instructions. In your novel, the bureaucrats in the Prime Minister's office act with remarkable objectivity. Well, I've, what led you to, to describe them as such? Uh, I, partly, this was accident. So this novel began as an idea. It uh, began as a bit of a lark. There was somebody on Twitter uh, who I follow and follows me. And he, he, he had tweeted, apropos of nothing in particular, uh, that it might be a good idea to have... Uh, fiction written on the sorts of things that go on in the PMO. This was the period in which a missile um, accidentally took off from India and landed in Pakistan. And yeah. then we didn't acknowledge it for two days. And yeah, we didn't. That sort of horror, you know, that you, you reach into the pockets of people and you take their money away hmm. um, on the basis of the idea that this this is helpful for the economy and will curb tenants. And? So I felt, well, here's, here's material to write fiction. And so I began writing it. My problem was that I didn't know what a novel was, and I didn't understand the idea that novels require character journey mm -hmm. to have somebody right. change over the period of the pages uh, and time, right. and the experience that leads him to be a different sort of person. My hero, my uh, protagonist, was the same to begin with and the same to end with. So I felt, so I wrote twelve thousand words, and then I threw it away, and then I restarted where I finished the the a person off on the second page and then saw what would come after him. Uh, but because there was this big shift that there is this chasm that that opens up, you might have the idea of people who not being given orders to do um, what they should be doing have a bit of, of agency more than they they would otherwise. And I think that was mainly what what uh, took me there. I don't know uh, any bureaucrats of the type that my two primary bureaucratic characters are modeled around. I think they're modeled around <laughs> other figures that I have either read about or uh, encountered in my life. But I would be very happy if we had bureaucrats of that sort uh, in India today, but, but sadly we don't. I'm glad I got that clarified. <laughs> Now, the, uh, the, the characters that you have, the bureaucrats working in the PMO, they have a certain humanness to them. Now, on page eight, early in the book, you set the trend for that acceptance of, uh, for the description of psychopancy. And I quote, The big man had been liked by most of the PMO staff and adored by many, naturally, as the boss. He received the respect that was his due in a hierarchical society. But he had also represented a certain idea of leadership with which they agreed. It was charismatic, confident, masculine. It was expressive and unrestrained. It was different from what had come before, which was modest and intellectual and appealed to some, but not to the many. 
psycho fancy, likable boss. Same things in my view. You can't well work in the PMO and without liking the guy that you're working for, can you? No, you also have to be really bright. I think that to rise in the bureaucracy, just like the IIT is, a, is the great filter of the middle class of who is more uh, able to uh, commit to studies uh, and so on, you, you require that element to be able to rise to the level of secretary. But once there, you know what it is that is required of you. This would not be a nation where a small foreign uh, power could come and take total control um, with very little resource and keep power for two centuries, still voluntarily giving it up. It, it, you require the, the opening page of a pendulum moon. He was uh, an ICS officer uh, who wrote a two-volume biography of the Raj in India. It opens with the page that we could not have done it without the active support uh, and the enthusiastic support of uh, Indians. And so they will line up. There's a lovely column in one of the Pakistani newspapers about, I think, one of their prime ministers uh, just about to lose office and what the army would say. And the columnist said that if India were to take over the next day, these same generals who were showing a bravado today would all line up and, and bow and scrape uh, before the enemy because uh, there is no real ethical basis for how they operate. To go back to what you said previously, I think one element of having a good, upright, honest uh, bureaucracy is ethics and uh, morality. The other is external uh, accountability. If I'm convinced, and I know for a fact, having worked in this space for 40 years or however long it is that a bureaucrat works before becoming secretary, that accountability will not come. They will do the wrong thing and they will be okay with... Um, going along with whatever it is that the file says, with the knowledge that they're not going to be punished for it, and they rarely are. So true. Very often I've heard bureaucrats tell me, oh, I, I don't like what I'm doing over here. I, I, I just go to work, earn my salary, and I go home. Just as bad as enthusiastically supporting vile and evil <laughs> things. <laughs> Which is true. That, that's, all, that's all the leader requires. He doesn't require you to clap, and he just he just wants you to sign at the bottom of that file, and yeah, and that's and that's what they do. Critical thinking being overrated. <laughs> yeah, very true, and it's not even they're not even asked. So the BBC filed two hundred and forty one RTIs. This was in twenty twenty one, one year after the lockdown. They went back to the government. How many people in the union government? Which ministries was it? Uh, disaster management was it? Finance was it? Health. How many ministers, how many ministries knew that a lockdown was coming that day? And the answer was none. No ministry was told. Because you know, like when when you're a king, you you operate like a king. The, the rest of the polity will figure out what to do in your wake. You don't need to be able to take take them along. They will come along behind you. So true, so true. But what ails us also is the fact that we have in our real politic. We have a rather ethnic and hierarchical and traditional polity, and we are trying to run this with a Western model of administration, and the lid doesn't fit the pot. True. Been almost eight decades. Yeah. And so it must follow that a dictatorship or an autocracy is convenient for those who don't see themselves for one reason or the other as participants in a democracy. Mm, I would say that this requires a deeper level of sort of analysis than my book uh, provides on what it is that participation at that level might mean. And I think that one of the problems of the novel after I finished it and I read a few other things was that I think the psychological element was absent from it, perhaps because of the fact that it's written in a kind of lighter vein. But there is, I think, scope to be able to think about, look into, and maybe write about. Speaking of the lighter side, page 99 completely cracked me up. It was the, so, uh, the fracas in the political office. And uh, the quote is, it was the sort of unsatisfying scrum that one expects from the middle-aged and elderly trying their hand at pugilism. <laughs> you wrote, <laughs> the distinction between voter and spectator had been erased you know, as it blossomed into a free-for-all. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, 
there is a passage I read as a young man that I've been in my teens then um, from one of the uh, novels that Woodhouse wrote about this character called Smith, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, a, there's a person on a hype bug on a soapbox who says something and the, and a kind of skirmish uh, begins. <laughs> but more, yeah, more than the words or the action, I think what really struck, what 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 stuck on in me was the the took the paradox between great anger and the will to produce violence, but the lack of competence in producing it. <laughs> so I think it's <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and this whole Woodhousean thing you further qualified by the part about the women jumping in. This set uh, included the small number of women members and legislators who set upon one another with a remarkable lack of dignity. Yes, I, I think the, the other thing is that if you were to be an observer in in our part of the world, especially of what a of what a street fight looks like between especially two middle class people, you know, two motorists or whatever, it's very rarely satisfying because you know, <laughs> because punches are not thrown competently, they don't land, they're not blocked. Like it, it becomes a kind of <laughs> jumble of of bodies. Where's Jean Claude Van Damme when you need him? Huh? That's true. <laughs> a couple of other stabs of at humor that you make, which are sometimes downright mischievous. You know, like that reference to the Doomsday Book when you describe that being in the office of the uh, mid-level bureaucrat. That's a metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> for, for two reasons. One is the one that you you are referring to. The other one is that it's the only Penguin Black classic that is outsized. It's very large. And uh, it's a bizarre kind of book where very few people will, will know of it. Uh, and I think having bought it... You, it's not the kind of book that you can actually sit through and read. Is it, so it's just a compilation of things that those... It's, it's land, it's land records. It's just land, land records, records and cattle records. Yeah, so... Cattle, yeah, that's right. Pro from that property, I know. People. But the, what the name is a very interesting one, as, right, as right. you have alluded to, and I think that it fits that, that page. Yeah, I figured that that was the case. Right now, we've talked about the responsibilities of citizens and we've uh, talked about bureaucratic responsibilities. Let's talk about yeah. journalistic responsibilities, uh, assuming there's such a thing anymore. You know, I like this uh, quote on page 75 about the op-ed page, and it runs like this. It says that the editor still ran her newsroom in the old-fashioned way, though it was clear that she was the last of her generation who would do this. The next phase, which had already come upon them, was about handing over media control to the state. I'm not sure that's a new thing. Is it a new thing? Uh, um, I, I would say it, uh, it has been amplified. So I used to be a newspaper editor 25 years ago. We, we both knew the person that I used to work with in Bombay. Yes. And I was an absolute tyrant in the newsroom. And I'm seeing this in the worst possible way that I... I was immature. Uh, I did all the wrong things, but there was little to no corporate pressure to to align either ideologically with something, whether it was government or business. And I think that there existed popular organs of some significant size in that period where you could have uh, done what was what is required to be done today, but no longer can be done. That even if you are uh, defined or you define yourself as being as doing a courageous journalism through reportage, even you are compelled to balance out your uh, edit op-ed pages because it's no longer possible in this kind of environment to show defiance um, to the government and and the state. Yes, this cycles back to the beginning of the conversation about journalism itself. It's it's a matter of uh, holding your government to account, isn't it? Question. There is no other point to it, and I think that there is there is a natural transition that already occurs, but which is not extended to its logical end. I'm going to throw a wild idea out here: editorial independence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, the West is, the, the US is trying this through having people not so much fund national newspapers, which they are also trying, but also through the idea of setting up uh, small bodies of reporters that do not have to depend on readership 
or or depend on subscriptions to be able to do their work and i think that's important but also free to write and speak and record what they want because they are not looking out for the next salary i think that's also important do you suppose it might take a few decades before the taste of uh, materialism among journalists can wear off progress of civilization and so on but <laughs> this 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 somebody i can't remember who who theorized that the reason that we don't see it, see other uh, alien societies, um, especially those that are sort of more um, advanced than us, is that all societies wipe themselves out when they reach a particular point of civilization. I think we are sort of headed there, not too far. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm done yet. <laughs> but it's a good point that you've got, you've got, say, you've got two trillion galaxies and you've got uh, 400 billion stars in ours. And so that's what, eight, 8 billion trillion galaxy uh, uh, stars but you don't see you don't see the aliens so so either you take the biblical kind of you know perspective we are the only we are the only part of the universe where there's life or uh we are at the most advanced stage of life which is improbable because we were we were sort of literate only 3 or 4000 years ago which is a, which is just a very tiny a fraction of time well my journeys in space are more yeah. related to why it is taking me the same time to drive to Mahatma Gandhi Road is to walk there. <laughs> now, you're writing journalist to novelist. Did the rigors of journalism mess with your muse when you came to write a novel? Yeah, I think that journalists may not necessarily be the make the best novelist because they are not trained in writing entertaining, pro, not entertaining, I suppose. And I don't know the code the other extreme and say floral and so on. But I was this right. this morning in bed I was reading a poem by Auden where he describes uh-huh. he describes a train, a, a mail train, a train carrying letters. And it's yeah. going up Scotland and he says that uh it had thrown over its shoulder the veil of its smoke. And I think that kind of uh, imagery uh-huh. very few writers I certainly don't have that eye to be able to put down kind of descriptive, rich, descriptive writing. Right. But you come from a discipline that uh, sort of frowns upon romanticizing railway engine exhaust. <laughs> right? Maybe not necessarily. You know, Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez's first piece as a journalist, he goes to a, a cemetery which is being dug up and the JCB or the excavator, it hits a grave and it pulls out perfectly formed, long red addresses with a skull and he describes the hair. Uh, in a way that few journalists might. I think with me, it's also the fact that I think that prose should be transparent like water and the reader should be thinking about uh, what you're saying rather than, you know, scratching his head about what you mean. So for me, that's important. Yeah, yeah I you know, so, you know, but now finally, before we go about you, from all I've known about you for what, how, some decades now, at yes, least, at least two decades now, more Your days that. are spent more than that, I guess. Your days yeah. are spent exploring the uh, next creative way to express yourself. So let me <laughs> let me explain. You've read extensively literature to begin with, as you described a little earlier. You learned to sing Hindustani classical. I love your Fender Strat, by the way, that you showed me once. You studied Urdu to be able to translate Manto. And you do a damn good job of patwa in your tweets. <laughs> what, I bet your next enterprise is something newly creative. What is it? It's a it's slightly more. So I, I'm about three fourths of my way through a screenplay, and I'm letting it marinate for a while before I go back to it. I don't know how how, how bad it is, but I'm I've got to deliver a couple of books. One is a but not. I, I have to deliver one book at some point next year for which I have a fellowship, um, which is on South Asia. Uh, which I'm working on. And there's another novel that I've begun writing on, which is a murder mystery set on Mars. So let's see how that's that That's not so futuristic anymore, is it? No, it's not, which is why, because I've been following the progress over the last seven, eight years. I, I have some material available already in terms of the, the technical stuff. And I don't want it to be about the technical stuff. I just want it to be a good story about people and about uh, conflict and about humans um, but the setting seems slightly sort of interesting so and there's one more we, uh, we pitched uh, my partner and I have pitched a graphic novel about New India for which, um, 
which we are waiting on. Yeah. The, the Mars one sounds particularly interesting, and I'm willing to bet that the commute is a lot shorter than getting to MG Road. <laughs> <laughs> it's between three and six months. I need to really figure out what, what it is that, you know, protagonists do in a small space during that length of time. Man, become Kafka is quite the end of it. I don't <laughs> well, on that <laughs> and every other project of yours, more part to your elbow. Akar Patel, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you for having me and it's always great to talk to you. That was the always entertaining Akar Patel, author of the novel After Messiah. There's a link in the podcast description to where you can, and I insist you should, buy that book. And it's time now for What's That Word? That fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And today we discuss the word Messiah, of course, following Akar's interview, right after this. And I'm back. This is What's That Word? And this is my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. Tell me, what gives today? What gives today is that lovely interview with Akar Patel. Thank you. So enjoyable and so full of literary references, Mm -hmm. which is totally my jam and a great deal more interesting than crappy politics. (laughs) Crappy politics? Is there another kind? (laughs) I guess not. And I find it amazing that people think political shenanigans have a beneficial effect on our lives. They hold out hope. Mm, And the one that fosters hope becomes the messiah. So does that uh, sum up the whole messiah thing? Totally. Very well put. You know, people believe that only supernatural forces will help them when, uh, say, the doctor tells them the truth, right? (laughs) And, you know, even though there's zero proof and enough evidence to the contrary. Right. Same thing. You know, the trouble is when the doctors start to believe in the supernatural. Oh, God. I know what you mean. Oh, who? (laughs) Okay. Busted. Look, it was a figure of speech, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we do here, don't we? (laughs) Indeed we do. So, speaking of which, P with an A, what's that word? The one obvious word is Messiah. Mm -hmm. Akar's book, titled After Messiah. I want to know the etymology of that word, Messiah. Okay, let's jump in first, the meaning. So, what do you know of the meaning? Well, only the obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean... Messiah is a savior of the people who has a special message and the golden key to improve everything. (laughs) Yes, it is as absurd as you make it sound. (laughs) Okay, now, the etymology, please. And when I was in Egypt, I was told Mm -hmm. the word has Egyptian roots. Okay, that's debatable. Now, it, it does have Semitic rather than Egyptian roots. I see. But is that strictly in the linguistic sense or does it go deeper? Well, the concept of the Messiah is deeply rooted in uh, Judaism, for instance. So it has Semitic origins and it's distinct from Egyptian religious and linguistic roots. Now, Egyptian language and culture have their own set of religious beliefs and terminology, which are quite separate from the Semitic traditions, and I'm I'm talking about ancient ancient Egypt, of course. Okay, but why did the Egyptians tell me they own the word? Probably because the pharaohs saw the convenience and the potential in the Messiah building industry and then made it their own. (laughs) Messiah building industry? (laughs) Yeah, you know, public relations, hype, fire and brimstone, (laughs) special effects, sound and light show. (laughs) <laughs> shock and awe <laughs> stop if you go on irreverently like this the higher powers will smite you they're very good at smiting oh shit <laughs> okay back to the etymology of messiah please it's will this be interesting <laughs> interesting sure crocodiles come into it is that interesting enough <laughs> what yes definitely but wait Crocodiles come into the etymology of Messiah. Yes. Okay, here's how it pans out. 
Let me not dwell on the linguistic and grammatical technicalities here, but let's jump straight to the application of the words. To begin with, let's talk about the word Christ. Now, what is well known is that Christ is the Greek word for anointed. And I did not know that in Greek, Christ meant anointed. Yes, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a translation. In, in fact, in the old church, it was a title, not a name. And it was used with the definitive article, you know, the, as in the Christ. Mm, yes, I have seen that often. But over time, it kind of became a name. Anyway, technically, Christos, the anointed, it's a noun, which is from the verb adjective, uh, chayin, or chayin, which means to rub or anoint, and that has uh, PIE roots. And then the plot twists and turns. Now, the ancient Egyptian word mese means crocodile. The question is, how do these two things, crocodile and anointed, work together? Yes, please. How? Well, the answer lies in the verb form, anointed, which is to rub. So the pharaohs were the anointed ones, anointed with guess what? Crocodile fat. Uh, what? Crocodile fat? Yes. Apparently, crocodile fat was believed to offer sexual potency and fertility. So, mese fat was the early Egyptian Viagra, and they rubbed it all over the pharaoh. Oh, poor Cleopatra. <laughs> <laughs> and then it reversed course, and the Jewish people supposedly adopted the custom, but they had to anoint their prophets with olive oil, I guess for the shortage of crocodiles in the Holy Land. <laughs> now, I don't know if this is remotely true or, to use a Latin word, it's just a big pile of caca. <laughs> Wait, what? Now, caca is a Latin word? <laughs> yes. Look it up in Google Translate if you don't believe me. Really? Wait, uh, I'm doing this right now. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> Dang, you're right. It is called kakas in Latin. And here I thought it was a South Indian word. We South Indians believe in action, not talk. <laughs> okay, now that I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, fine. Whether or not the ancient Egyptians, such as your tourist guide in Cairo, believe that crocodile fat came into its etymology, uh, almost all the Judeo-Christian slash Abrahamic faith references to a prophet are invariably Messiah. And a Messiah is a central figure in their faith, and thereby the word naturally evolved. Mm, cool. Well, yeah. And, you know, modern scholars and theologians have grappled with understanding messianic concepts, you know, in the light of political and religious developments. Mm, like specifically? As before, for instance, the Messiah is a metaphorical symbol of hope and transformation for personal and social redemption. Right. And when nicely packaged, so much more saleable. <laughs> sure. Low in carbs and very slimming. Buy now. <laughs> well, all that was most enlightening and gives Akar's book After Messiah that much more context for me. Yes, it does. But, but thank you. It never ceases to amaze me how so much of what we say is based on concepts from thousands of years before. Really? Yeah. And not everything is as simplistic as saying that English came from Latin and Hindi from Sanskrit and there's Tamil and so on. No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, even those linguistically well-developed, like Hebrew and the ancient Egyptian dialects and Sanskrit and Tamil all have earlier roots and it all gets rather messy. Yes, uh, you did say during the interview with Professor Ganesh Devi that languages evolve gradually and their origins are often shrouded in prehistory. Well, to be fair, I was paraphrasing from his book, but yes, ancient tongues have even more ancient roots and saying one knows the origins of whatever old language they Hebrew is to make things too facile. Yes, I have been learning this too much. Most useful, like crocodile fat. <laughs> much wisdom from Hebrew. But what I need now is a Shebrew. <laughs> Bye. And that is our show. 
I'd like to thank my guest, Akar Patel, and my co-host, Pranati P. with an A, Madhav. And I'd like to thank all of you for staying and for listening and for being so nice with all your comments. Well, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't left a comment, leave a comment. And if you haven't hit that like button, hit the like button. What are you waiting for? This is Ramji Chandran. Until we meet again, this is The Literary City. Literary City.